Nigel Short playing white against Robert Byrne of the United States playing black. And these two players have rather more in common than just the fact they both play chess. They both are extremely fond of Bach. Robert Byrne likes it straight, perfectly on a harpsichord. Nigel Short likes it dressed up by deep purple. So a cool classical style or a heavy rock style for this group game. The position in the group is as follows. Uh, Gligerich has got back into contention by his victory over Hort. So if Short can even get a draw today, he'll be the clear leader. On the other hand, if Byrne can win, then in that case he goes top. With me, as usual, to give his expert advice and commentary, Bill Hartston. Bill, uh, we saw a tremendous win by Nigel Short in the first round. This is the only game in this group he's going to be playing white. What are his chances against Robert Byrne? I think he'd be very encouraged by the win in the first round, but it, equally uh, the, the pressure's off Byrne. Now, now that Short has won a game, Byrne is really going to take him seriously. And it doesn't look quite so bad if, if he loses too. Mm. Right, well, the game's already begun. Let's join it. Uh, and you can bring me up to date, if you would, on what's actually happened in the position they're in with Short playing white. Well, they've played 27 moves already. And Short has grabbed an advantage in space. Bill, um, Robert Byrne has just moved his knight back from G6 to E7. Uh, is that an attempt to grab space, or is he surrendering more space? You have to um, see what's been happening so far in the game, really. It's, it's a typical uh, Sicilian defence type of position, with white taking over space in the centre by these pawn advances, and blacks adopting this hedgehog type of formation, with pawns on the third rank rather, rather than whites on the fourth. Now, black has eventually to break out of this position, either by advancing his d-pawn to d5, and that's where the knight move comes in. It's another piece on the d5 square. N nearly all white pieces are defending the d5 square, or that can break with b5 later, and he has to be thinking about one of those advances. Now, Nigel's last move of f4 is the beginning of some signs of aggression. Up to here, he's been defending his extra space. Now he's trying to, to get even more, and he's thinking of advancing his pawns on the king's side for an attack. Burns treating this whole game very cautiously. Let's join the game with Nigel Short, white, to play and see what he thinks of Robert Burns' last move, his knight back to e7. Yes, that's a good move. Now oh, I can't go e5 because of knight f5. Well, what should I do? Should I prevent knight f5 at some point, or prepare f5 myself? As I quite like this idea. Just playing g4, maybe, maybe it's a bit risky. I mean, I'm exposing my own king here, but then again, he's no way of getting at it immediately. I like to play g4, the idea of just f5, knight f4, put pressure on his king side. Yes, just g4 here. Hmm. At 15, I would probably play g4 too. But I rather like it for black, because it slightly exposes the white king, and, and I really think my own king is is quite secure, but there isn't any real chance of a an effective breakthrough here. But what should I do now? I'd love to have my bishop on the a8, h1 diagonal. If I play bishop c6, however, there's knight d4 with a small tempo gain, bishop a8. And how would I follow that up? Perhaps just with uh, knight c6 and remove a knight. I like my position, but I don't find a way to really increase its mobility or attacking chances, especially since he's still stopping me from playing b5. 
On the other hand, knight c6, what can I do with that? Well, knight b4, that's one of those aesthetic moves that, uh, like a parade ground, a lot of marching around, and what does it do? Ah, oh, but there's another possibility, strange possibility of t attacking that b pawn and keeping a white piece attacked if I play knight a5. Well, I'm running rather short of time now. I'm going to try knight c6. Well, that's okay. He's moving another piece away from the king side. And what's he going to do that knight? Well, knight b4, wow, it's nothing. Nothing at all. I'm just going to continue. Bring all my pieces over to the king side. I'm going to start with queen g3. And that will prepare an attack along the g file. We may be g5 at some stage. Or even f5. And then I'll be th threatening the d-pawn. Yes, queen g3. That figured. He wants to kill me on the king side, naturally. He's going to move that knight on the second rank out of the way, slip a rook over, and make some break here. But, <clears throat> but, but let's see now about knight a5. Knight a5. Besides, there's a little trap with knight a5. If he defends that pawn by either knight d4 or knight c1, I have a little combination here. Knight takes b3. Knight takes b3 in reply, queen takes c4, check. Knight e2, bishop takes a4, pinning the knight, attacking it twice. And on rook b1, I take the e-pawn. I've picked up no less than four pawns for the piece. Beautiful position. Well, all right, he's not going to fall for that, but, but, uh, but even if he doesn't, he'll have to make some move like rook b2 or rook b1 and, and take one of those attacking pieces out of action. All right, knight a5. Ah, oh, didn't expect that. Yes, well, how am I going to defend this thing? Maybe just knight c1 here. But, oh no, you can play knight takes b3. That looks really strong. This, my whole position seems to collapse then. Well, I think I'm just going to have to defend this pawn with my rook. I want to play... Well, if I go rook b2, then maybe even queen a3 is annoying. I think just I'll just play rook b1 and, th and threaten b4. Yes, I don't really like this. I like my, my rooks on the d file. But it's annoying to take them away to defend to, to defend my queen side. Still, I'm going to have to play it. Rook b1. Well, right. I've gotten one rook off the d-line. Uh, of course, yeah, I, I've just given him the threat of b4. So I have to do something with the queen. Well, there's only one uh, aggressive-looking move, and that's queen b4. It has the advantage of pinning the knight to his rook on d2, and it does give me, once I've got that set up with queen b4, it does finally give me the chance to break with b5. All right, I'll try queen b4. Yes, his threats on the queen side are looking quite dangerous now. B, b5 is a, is a strong threat. Um, Yes, I'm really going to have to hurry up my attack on the king side and just play g5. And if he plays h takes g, queen takes g5, and then plays b5, well, I can continue with e5. And uh, his d-pawn's pinned, and I can pl follow that up with knight e4 and knight f6 check. I probably get at least a draw. Well, it gives me some chances. I'll just go g5. Yes, I knew that was coming. Such ambition. Well, I've got to do something about that king side. But first, of course, I have to begin with uh, hg no matter what. hg. 
Well, F takes G is just nonsense. I'll continue with my plan to play Queen takes G5. Right, of course. Now it's going to be a knight move, a rook move, and he wants to make me on G7. Well, I'm going to have to uh, shift a defense here, but I like that because uh, his opening the G line was quite two edged. He split his F and H pawns, so any end game here is going to be good for black. So I'm going to drive off an attacker, and I'm going to offer the exchange of queens at the same time. With queen c5. Yes, that's quite annoying. He's just quite prepared to defend instead of going out for, for well, an all-out attack on the queen side. Well, I'm going to have to bring my queen back. I definitely can't afford to exchange queens, but still, I've got some reasonable chances. I think I'll play queen g3. That'll stop him, him playing queen e3, which looks quite awkward. Yeah, still, this is quite good for me. Because now I like my position. I like that the weakening of his king's side. Now I want to put my main attack on the king's side. So the first shift should be queen h5. I don't know what I can get to follow that up, but, uh, but yes, I like this two-edged position. Queen h5. Well, it seems to me that in some ways Short's playing a much sharper game than Bern is here. Yes, it's, it's funny that both sides like their positions, but uh, I must confess I, I agree with Byrne here. I don't believe this white attack on the king's side. Uh, it's characteristic of Short um, uh, ambitiously to, to play for even more space and attack when he, he has a little control of space anyway, but I don't think this should lead anywhere. Right, well, let's regain and join the game with Nigel Short White to play. Yes, he's just defending here, but how am I going to continue now? Maybe, well, I want to play my knight from e2, get it out of the way and play rook g2, and then maybe move my king and play my other rook to g1. Well, that'll, that'll give me tremendous threats along the g file. Yes, knight d4 also has the merits of defending my b pawn, and there's no other sensible square to put my my knight on e2, so I'll just play knight d4. Hmm. Now, I'd love to switch a rook, a rook c5, to the king's side, and I have to prepare for that. At the same time, of course, I have to defend my g7 square, which is going to be under attack as fast as he can get a rook there. So, queen h6. Yes. Well, I'm just going to play a rook over to the g file. Play rook g2. Because also, he might be threatening a move like e5 here. Maybe that's no good, but still, I don't like my f-pawn being pinned. I'm just going to play rook g2. Now, should I play rook c5? The main idea I have here, my main winning try, would be rook c5 to h5, forcing a passive defense with rook h2, and then perhaps Rook h4, forcing another passive defense of the f-pawn, and then I can take it from there. Now, in rook c5, he has, of course, b4, the fork b4. Then I capture on c4. He plays uh, b a. The rook takes d4, b c, and I play bishop c6. Well, he has, a, of course, a passed pawn there, but it's not easy to support and my pieces will be very active. But I don't know, because I have another move here, too. I can play queen f6, 
Now that that should be awkward for him. I wish I wish I weren't so short of time here. I could make up my mind more easily. Queen F six. Now that that ought to produce some trouble. All right, I'll try Queen F six and shift the rook on the next move. Queen F six. Yes. Well, what am I going to do with my knight? Maybe just rook d1. That looks okay. But I've got something else here. It looks quite attractive. Maybe I can play knight f5. If he plays e takes f, knight d5, queen h6, and knight e7 check, king f8, knight takes f5, he plays queen f6, then knight takes g7. Yes, I get some quite good chances there. But he hasn't got very much time left. I think this move could give him a lot of trouble. He's only a few minutes, and it will be very difficult to work out the consequences of, of that move. Yes, I'm just going to play knight f5. Ooh, I overlooked that. I really don't know if it's right. It may, it may be dead wrong, but I've only got a minute on my clock, and I don't like to have to defend against that attack. If I take that knight, knight d5, queen h6, knight e7, check king f8, knight f5, queen f6, knight takes g7, what then? He's going to try to bring a rook to the e-line to cut off my king, move the knight away, and give mate with the queen on g8. What defense would I have against that? Bishop d7, bishop c6. Uh, no, he would do that right in my time pressure. What a brat. Uh, no, I, I, I just am afraid I wouldn't be able to handle that. I'll have to, I just have to grab something reasonably safe. G6. Isn't that a blunder? I thought he had to take my knight on f5. I, I think I've got the move knight takes d6 now. Threatening his rook on c8. And if he plays rook takes d6, e5. Well, this is this seems crushing. Why, why am I not winning this? This knight takes d6 looks tremendous. Oh, damn. If I had seen that, I would have taken the knight no matter what, because this is ridiculous. One move and I'm lost. It's completely lost. Now, this is, this is ridiculous. Uh, take the knight, of course, as a fork with e5. But if I don't take the knight, it's worse yet. If I save that rook, he plays e5. Queen g7, he just piles in knight on c to e4 to f6. Check, it's destruction. Well, this thing is totally gone, but at least I don't want to overstep. I'm just going to have to give here. Rook takes d6. Well, now I've got to play e5. But still, this ought to be winning for me. Of course, yes. Well, I just have to fish as best I can. Queen f5. Now I get a tremendous position. So, I'd better take take his rook off now. This looks good. I'm just... E takes d6. Ah, there are no rational moves here. This is... This is awful. But the only thing to do is to just mess it up. Therefore... B5. Well, they both made the time controls and some kind of pressure on Burns' part and uh, Nigel Shorten is in an enormously powerful position looking and sounding as if he was going to win fairly clearly. Bill, what did actually happen? How did the game now develop? Well, Burn really is struggling here having lost this exchange. Short completely bamboozled him. Let's just see how White tries to kill him. Rook comes to the d-file, supporting this, this tremendous pass pawn. Bishop attacking a rook. e2. Burn must try to find some play on the queen side. He's taken a pawn here. Now they've followed a lot of exchanges on, on the b5 square. Black finally got in this freeing move of b5. But a bit too late. 
extraordinary game this. Everything coming off on B5. We're just going to be left with a position where white has just clear rook against knight and still this past D, past D pawn. Are the rooks pinned, so white moved out of the pin, king to F2. And that's where we are at move 45. And let's rejoin the game there with Robert Byrne to play. Still in a certain amount of difficulty, still having to resolve this problem of being a piece and a pawn down, an exchange and a pawn down. Back to the game with Byrne to play his 45th move. King F2. Oh, I wasn't worried about that. I mean, any more than I am about anything else. But what would I have done on Queen D3? That's the move that that added another gray hair to my top. Uh, queen D3, I would have had to try, I don't know, some hand-to-mouth existence like Queen A4 or what. Anyway, I'm very relieved he's giving me time to consolidate my pieces. And if I play Knight C5, I not only prevent the advance of the pawn for the moment, but the knight constantly bears on the E4 square, which is a fork square, and produces all kinds of tactical possibilities here. Well, knight c5. Well, I can't make any progress with my d-pawn in this position. Maybe I should just try and smash up his, his king side. So I've got too many isolated pawns, and it would be quite useful if I could get rid of some. If I just play h4, threatening h5, well then, what's he going to do? Knight d7? Then I go queen g5. Yes, this, this has got to be winning for me. h4. Oh, am I glad to see that. He just doesn't have the luxury to fool around with pawns here. The whole thing is the consolidation of his pieces to advance the d-pawn. I wonder if he's overlooked the plan I have here. I'll, I'll, I'll bet he hasn't caught all the points of it. He doesn't, he probably doesn't realize his d-pawn is in great danger. Oh, play rook d8, attack the pawn, and then I have queen b6 later with a discovered check tempo. Right, rook d8. Well, what's that doing? Now, if I just continue with h5, what's he got? Looks completely finished. Uh, maybe you can go queen b6 there. Yes, that looks quite good. Then I'll have to move my king or something. Then you can take my d-pawn. And I'm probably, probably not winning. This is terrible. How am I going to stop this threat? Well, I've got it. Maybe just queen e3. And if he plays queen b6, then I just defend my, my pawn with queen d4. Yeah, this, this looks okay. Queen e3. Oh, I like that. I like that. It can't be. It can't be. I know it can't be, but that he could fall into a trap here. But there is such a trap. If I play queen b6 now, he could plump right into queen d4, which would be smashed by rook takes d6. He can't play queen takes rook because of knight e4, double discovered check, and knight takes the queen on d6, winning a queen. Ah, well. I do think I've saved the game. Queen b6. Well, now just queen d4. What's he got? Oh, no, he can play rook takes d6. That's terrible. I'm completely lost then. Well, there must be some other way to defend this pawn. No, rook, rook e d2, knight e4 check. This is a disaster. I've just lost my, my d pawn. 
I don't think there's any way of defending it. Maybe if Rook C2, and if he plays Rook takes D6, then I can play Rook takes C5. And then if he takes on D1, then Rook C8 check. And I pick up his Queen on B6. Well, yes, it's messy, but maybe even this is winning for me. Rook C2. Ah, oh, damn, that's a nice, rational move. He could have fallen into so many traps here. Ah. Well, but I ought to be thankful <laughs> I'm getting out of this alive, I suppose, and not be so awfully greedy. But, of course, uh, Rook takes D6. He wants to give me some of my own trappy medicine <laughs> with Rook takes C5, Rook takes D1, Rook C8 check, and I, I part with my queen. Uh-huh. So we have to do this thing in a little different order of moves. We have to begin with knight e4 check, yes. Knight e4 check. With both players setting and evading traps, it looks very much as if Robert Byrne has managed to fight off that rather sharp attack by Nigel Short and may not perhaps after all lose, as appeared very possible just a few moves ago. Bill, take us through the next few moves. Yes, it really looks as if Short's let Byrne bamboozle him. This d6 pawn, which, which looked set to win the game for White, is now attacked by all of Black's pieces. Of course, White's in check at the moment from the knight. Can't take the knight, because then he'd be in check from the queen on the diagonal. So White has to move his king away. And now the pawn's ready for execution. But first, Black has to exchange queens. Queen's coming off. White must recapture, of course. And now both rook and knight attacking the pawn. Take with a rook first to make sure that these rooks get exchanged. After the exchange of rooks, we're just going to reach for sending of rook and two pawns, two split pawns, against knight and three. It's very difficult for white to make any progress. Knight coming in, checking, attacking this pawn. And this is white's only hope, to get the king to f6. And then there might be a threat of mate, with rook on c8. But the king comes out to stop the king, the white king coming in. Now white's forced on the defensive. Rook's normally worth knight and two pawns, but in this position, knight and one can easily hold. Even a threat of black winning now with knight g4 check, he has to watch out for that. Rook coming to attack the knight, and the knight checking the king to force the king further back, and it's impossible to see either side making any progress here. In fact, it looks as if Nigel Short's going to offer a draw. Would you like a draw? Sure. Okay, thanks. A good draw for Nigel against Robert Byrne, or do you think he was swindled? It was a good game, but he certainly should have won it. He just didn't quite have the technique. But after two games, he has a win and a draw against two grandmasters, and that's remarkable. And it does, in fact, raise the very real possibility that Nigel Short, this 15-year-old schoolboy, could actually finish top of the group. And if he did, that would be as big a shot as Lothar Schmidt finishing top of his group last year. As you can see, he needs just half a point to cause a very real upset by ousting all three of these grandmasters and qualifying for the final. Next week, we're going to leave Group A. We're going over to Group B, where the other English player, Tony Miles, who, of course, is a grandmaster and a very outstanding and leading one, is leading by half a point from Donner and Schmidt. Next week, Tony Miles takes on Hein Donner of Holland. They've had some vintage battles in the past. That will almost certainly be spectacular. Miles needing to win to qualify there. A draw would help him a long way down the way. Until next week, from all of us here in Bristol, good night. <laughs> Next week's game will be slightly later at 6.35.